Well, here we are, back again where it all began, full circle and imploded, punished and tired. I've shown how the continued mismanagement of all parties involved and the general shittiness of Konami led to the entire MGS team mimicking the series, growing together, perfecting shit, rounding it off, only to grow bloated and disjointed, falling apart, continuing as a confused husk. Kojima may very well have been the little man with the big head upon the ivory penis, but he is not the one here just to suffer. He is, in fact, the one here for revenge. Not for honor, but for himself. While everyone else will be left as dust. Diamond dust. Limping off into the sunset, ready for a new tomorrow. But that tomorrow might never come. Big corporate restructurings were happening at Konami early on this decade, shifting the focus towards mobile games and gambling with many studios being merged, renamed or shut down, as the individual devs got demoted all over, which included Kojima and his studio. Things already weren't going too hot with many of its key talent leaving, the troubled development of Rising, the poor sales of the last main game and the bloated costs of their brand new engine and so there came to exist a bit of friction between what Konami wanted as a company, i.e. big money, big fast, and what Kojima wanted, i.e. creative freedom. A friction very similar to what got Team Silent callously shut down years earlier. After all, there's no room for faces in a faceless company. No place for Hideo. And sure, Never Dead, Shadows of Memes, Silent Hill, and indeed the MGS series itself were all super creative games with a high budget, but they weren't funded in that Sony oh yeah, the art kind of way, but more so in a way that only reflected how little of a shit Konami's top brass actually gave. As long as it sells, you can do whatever. But if it don't, you're just a waste of budget, so bye bye Shinta, bye bye Team Silent, bye bye Igarashi, bye bye Junko Kawano, and so on. And so, Kojima once again saw the writing on the wall, this time saying, Finish the game or get Mobile Division, you dumb bitch! Knowing fully well that he'd get Mobile Division anyway. However, he saw an opportunity on the horizon in Sony's Oh yeah, the art! Attitudes being on full blast, fucking funding David Cage's bullshit, no question. So, he got together some industry friends and context what he's made over the years, looked at which property people would really like to see him have a go at, and made a fake demo for a fake Silent Hill game co-directed by Guillermo del Toro, starring Noring Nimbus, and released onto PSN without Konami's knowledge and with their MGS5 budget and with Sony's knowledge. Shaking all manner of hands and dicks in the process, thus setting up the perfect coup d'etat storm for a non-MGS game made with Sony's Oh yeah, the art! money that he'd wanted to make for ages, while simultaneously taking care of Konami's hard contracts and sketchy ex-con gulagery just as well. Which actually worked, seeing as all of this pissed off the CEO man so much that he scrubbed Kojima's name off of MGS5's promo art, removed PT from PSN, removed sales listings for PS4s with PT installed on them, and eventually locked the game with a patch for those who still had it. All the while, Hideo looking like the wholly innocent victim in all of this, and Konami quite rightfully, but in this case also sort of unfairly, like the big evil company they had perhaps always been behind the scenes. Getting fans from all around the world to rally behind Kojima, ganking Konami to shit. So much so that even today any tweet or video related to any of their games will have at least a few hashtag fuck Konamis on there. And so then, while in the midst of all of this, the limp, unfinished, bloated MGS5 flopped its way onto store shelves, it disappointed and pissed off all of the hype childs and fangirls, creating even more ire towards Konami despite the high sales. Hoisted by their own petard, as it were. And Kojima from Vice Penis, back to Pussyfuck. Though, uh, before all of this was to properly transpire, there would be one more game. Well, sorta. 
You see, not only was MGS5 clearly unfinished due to all of the above, it was also preemptively split into two, with its deceptive tanker setup McPlot twist chapter being pawned off as its own game for 30 bucks. Ground Zeroes was the name and picking up where Peace Walker left off was its game. We see Snake Boss climbing up from the rocks like a Metal Gear 2S boy, keeping us waiting like a self-aware me. Kept you waiting, huh? Hold up. What, what's up with his voice? Yeah, so around this time is where Kojima started hanging out with celebrities on Konami and perhaps even already the Sony doll, which then allowed him to start including Hollywood actors. And hey, fair enough, I guess. 70% of his body does exist out of movies after all, but something about callously cutting out the most iconic actor and one of the most iconic video game voices, period, for the supposed finale of the series feels a bit fucked up. Now, you could maybe think that there's some type of meta reason for this, and perhaps there is, which I will tangentially get into later, but most in-game lore reasons for this potentially being a thing are kinda rendered moot by the notion that the Japanese voice actor did stay the same. So it just feels weird and distracting here, though even then the dude barely says anything, which in and of itself is an odd contrast to everything we've seen before. Hmm. I think people looking into this more though weren't wrong or anything either, given how batshit insane this game's release cycle was in the first place. As I've said, and as you've seen, Konami likes to get meta on his audience. Anything from MGS2's Protag swap where all the promotional material pretended Snake was the real guy, to MGS4's bizarre ass trailers that had quite a lot to say for themselves. And while shit for sure mellowed out after that, it still didn't stop people from turning these meta pensions into one giant meme. And with Kojima most likely being aware of that, he decided to ratchet that shit up big time. Yeah, dude made up a fucking studio and fake director to announce both MGS5 parts, with Ground Zeroes being touted as the actual main game whilst in fact not being that, and the main game, i.e. the Phantom Pain, being presented as its entirely own unrelated game. Yes, uh, I had a little accident, uh, but I should be good by uh, GDC coming up. You know, a lot of people have been wondering who you really are, uh, what Moby Dick Studios is working on. Um, when are you going to tell us more about the Phantom Pain? Are you going to be able to share more tonight? Yes, I plan uh, on attending uh, this show uh, coming up in San Francisco, uh, but I don't have uh, anything uh, to show today, unfortunately. All of this is really fucking stupid. Didn't fool people for very long either. Pretty much day one shit was being rumored to have been MGS5, but it did set things off on a really weird tip. Not to mention the interviews Kojima started giving himself about the game going to be way shocking and shit, tackling ideas no game had done before. So by the time Ground Zeroes dropped, people were prime out there looking for said fucked up shit, as well as additional meta shit and unexpected shit. And all of these shits would certainly be there. Just to set up some, I'ma get into more later, there's allusions to forced rape. The setting is, at the very least, based off of Guantanamo Bay. There's a mission in which you straight up delete logos of the main MGS games whilst leaving the mobile and spin-off ones, as if to say, once again, that there's no place for Hideo and that the gulag dwellers and lower budget cynicism has taken over or whatever the fuck. This is certainly a very clever and spicy meme. You see, it is no longer Konami games. Oh no. It is Kojima games in particular. Ah yes. And there's the entire plot that seems to mostly roll back most of anything that Peace Walker had walked in, essentially clean slating the clean slate with dirtied, muddied, dusty hands, smooching up that slate proper. Ah. The actual game was still pretty good though.
taking cues from other popular stealth games, it has a more modern conventional control scheme and various streamlining additions made to the base gameplay. Getting caught, for instance, doesn't instantly trigger an alert but instead lets you max pain a bitch and... You can kinda see silhouettes through walls as well, The Last of Us style, which greatly mitigates some of the visibility issues brought on by the now far more zoomed in third person over the shoulder camera. A thing that adds to this in a really cool way is how the binos work now, in that you can tag dudes and track them easy, essentially letting you plan shit proper from higher vantage points, serving as a type of pre-game huddle soliton radar with far more hands-on vibes as you tend to create the map yourself. And moreover is the idea that you can look at anything and hit the radio button to get info. Which is an incredibly well-blended, quick and easy evolution of MGS3's pick up and ask about it codec calls. Just, uh, you know, w with a lot less character and far more to the point. But it still makes the camp feel like it has a lot of purpose to it, as if it's a real place. All of the guard towers, comm signals, tent placements, doors, rooms, side thingies, huts and truck routes aren't there just to make for interesting snake mans, guard mans, but also because they have a real life reason to be there. What you can now learn about through Bino Banter. Additionally, the binos also include the directional mic, which is an item most games in the series have had, but wouldn't have ever been used much outside of a force sequence or two or a poop me. That now, due to the much larger accessibility, can be used to overhear random guards chatting on about whatever. Those new guys. You see their choppers? Who are they with? It's me, man. Green berets, seals. Already, just on this aspect alone, the game design feels quite clever, which luckily extends to the overall game design and feel just as well. Smooth and satisfying is how I'd buzz it up if I'd have to. Shooting feels good, what with that slow down upon spot and those big crunchy meaty skull fucky sound effects when you pop a boy in an already urgent high tension situation, thus maybe popping you as well, nudge nudge wink wink. Big Boss also clacks on to cover with an elegance I don't think any game had really nailed up to this point. And the control scheme is rather intuitive, and not as weirdly mech-like as it was in any of the prior games, while seemingly not sacrificing any of their depth. Like, I, I saw some people say that it did, but I think it really only feels as if it does, because the old games wouldn't telegraph their deeper functions as much, thus letting you surprise yourself by finding them out on your own. Here, they're all prompted, telegraphed, and tutorialized, so the idea that choke, interrogate, stab a bitch, hang, crawl, jump, climb, and proper platform, or side roll, or back crawl, or lean up and peer over or under shit in various ways are as neat as novel get dunked on. Generally, though, it just tucks more features under less buttons, in that there's differences in contextuality and whether or not you hold down a button or tap it quickly. Overall, boiling shit down to a more modern feeling control scheme that you'd see in any other third person shoulder shooter. Like I said, intuitive. The satisfying part though comes from how good all of it feels to do. I mean, the walking speed is perfect. The sounds of the rain, menu cursors, the glowing phosphorus buzz of your map, or the swift beefiness of how snake jumps, or how swervy yet simplistically controlled the vehicles are, it, it all adds up to a game that's coated in super satisfying vibes that make you want to keep playing ad nauseum. It's quite the achievement, honestly, given that this series, up until this point, while very deliberate in its intent, was often a bit fiddly to control which took some getting used to. The CQC in 3 is a good example of that. I guess it's just nice to see the series both embrace and perfect the modern box standard third person shoot guy control scheme on its first try. Uh, 
you know, not counting for, which was still more of its own strange little thing. Adding to all of this, in either case, is the fact that it kind of takes the concept of the set piece and turns it into one big open map, with the various sectors, entry points and playful distractions and options all intact, but functioning as one cohesive, communicating whole. Rather than set pieces chopped up by loading screens and clear binary states of spottage. It's more emergent, I guess. Organic, perhaps. With tons of voice lines recorded to react to the many ways, places and points in time you could be fucking boys up. Which indeed was always a thing, but with you now being able to physically see or hear motherfuckers from miles away telecomming each other or making their way on over and thus can pull shit like intercepting or distracting search teams, learning the patrol routes, sabotage their cars or guns or comms equipment or preemptively take out all of the lights with the effects being felt all over the base and there always being someone out there looking for you based on some trace you left behind, be it footsteps, a body or a car engine they heard a perrin, makes things so much cooler and immersive than the far more gimmicky LOL, if you blow up this one food shack the guards way later in the game will complain about being hungry, Oh, That shit's just how the game be by default now. There's no segmentation or linear structures that forced all of the previous games into much more of a set PC arcadey headspace. And don't get me wrong, that was a great ass headspace to be in in the first place, but it's just that this seems like a very properly fleshed out, big budget, well considered and designed open evolution of that space. It's MGS3 times 4, I guess. On a mission filled with deja vu, Snake came across a Johnny having a poo. Crude as a man he was, Snake thought of a prank. Blow him up with a hand grenade and release the stack. However, Snake's mood did soon sank, as Johnny's porta potty was built like a tank. Oh, poor Johnny. Oh, poor pooping Johnny. So we after Peace Walker now, and everything is going its merry way with cause causing and snake sneaking when suddenly it is revealed that Paws was being kept at Guantanamo Bay and that Chico, who was all like, Apparently, UFOs are connected to cattle mutilations. Cattle mutations? No, 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 no. Not mutations. Mutilations. It's a word I'd never heard before. Now it was all like... Whenever I talk to Paz, my heart starts pounding and, and everything I say comes out wrong. And got himself held prisoner too, due to a head-ass failed rescuing attempt. So now, Snake has to go over there to free the homie and question the spy and trying to find out what that whole cipher bullshit was all about. Only to find said cipher bullshit being very present indeed under the guise of our now brand new anime terrorist, Skullface. Not that you'd really know any of this from the cutscenes, as aside from a few minor squabbles over the intercom, the vast, and I do mean vast, fucking majority of the plot, including the crucial setups in regards to how we even got here, are stashed away in tapes that one can listen to either during play or from menu. And it's, uh weird. I mean, shit like the codex worked because they provided extra flavor and tasty exposition, fleshing out what you were already getting from the game itself. But with these tapes, it's as if the seasoning has become the main course. Kojima himself went on record saying that he felt that cutscenes had become outdated, even though they clearly ain't, not in his current eyes or even in those of the greater industry as a whole, and even if they were, I don't think that cutting the entire notion of an in-game story down to optional tapes was all that great of a fucking call. But I guess it is what it is, and they are also pretty great to listen to. Some have that classic MGS podcasty vibes where it feels like a little movie playing inside your head, especially with the audio drama level sound design no doubt done up while 
doing stature, and others do feel a bit dry and more like tutorial as exposition rather than conversations, but then the Codex were pretty guilty of that too, even if Snake did interject more in those. And finally, there's a few that are a bit, um, well... She caressed my stomach with her long white fingers, then slid them upwards between my bikini-clad breasts. What? Wait! I sputtered as her moist eyes met mine. She was beautiful. Somehow, I found myself... Jesus Christ. <laughs> There's one tape that's just straight up lesbian fanfiction between Paws and Strangelove. There's lore here for sure, fleshing out Mother Base with the addition of Cat and stories of how Snake and Cause would wrestle while naked, but man, th this ain't so much male gaze as it is male masturbating furiously. Gently, carefully, she rubbed the lotion all over my entire body. Keep it in your goddamn pants, Kojima, Jesus Christ. But then, there's also the rape tape. Either you take her now, or you are strung up next. Oh. Don't worry, Chico. No. No. It is okay, Chico. You won't hurt me. I don't. Get on with it. I can't. Chico. No. Come on. Skullface forces Chico to rape Paws, which is then followed afterwards by Paws being almost like, it's okay, I dug it, let's do it again, while the cheek is very clearly, deeply, heavily traumatized by the whole thing. Uh, I, I, I don't think that including rape in fiction is necessarily a bad thing on its own. I have some very personal reasons to object to it, but in theory, if it occurs in real life, it's bound to take presence in the stories we tell to reflect it. I, I get that. But here it comes after a talking cat, a fucking J-pop mech battle plot twist, Paws herself being almost cartoonishly evil in the villain tapes, lesbian fanfiction, and Skullface not being built up very well aside from him being all I know how you feel. I've felt that. So show me that I'm not the only one, that you too can return to this world for revenge. Do you see me? Don't die. Don't die. Ah. And so, it is just way too heavy of a thing to be so callously shoved in there for easy weight gain. It's fucked up, tactless, ill-considered, and clearly written with little to no knowledge of what that shit actually does to people and those around them. It, 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 it tries to be deep, but ends up being on par with those evil 80s rape thugs from those movies you'd see on a fucking episode of Best of the Worst. So Snake rescues both of our ill-contrived, tortured little plot MacGuffins and heads back on Heli. During said rescuing, Yui had set up a government nuke checkup thingy so that the entire world could believe that they didn't have any nukes and were just an otherwise totally Gucci private army, you guys. Only said checkup was actually just Skullface pulling up with the gang on a drive-by so that when Snake Chico THE MEDIC and what's left of Paws get back, they find shit to be very much on fire and all of the copped Peace Walker boys gunned down. Miller <laughs> promptly joins Snake and Co. on Heli as they escape, leaving the base a burning and Skullface looking very bad indeed. Essentially setting up a new villain and moreover a tone going forward. That of a very angry, very bitter, very vindictive cause who becomes a thing right about here. You spy bitch! Come on, start talking, bitch! And also everyone else being an asshole now too. Searching for revenge and a purpose and... There's another in my... <laughs> Just all-around classiness, really. And, uh, yeah, that's the plot. Woo! 
short and salty, much like I'd have imagined Kojima himself to be at this point, because, uh... What took you so long? This is where we get back to the very beginning of the end that is the very beginning of this very video, with Hideo sneakily making and releasing a horror game called PT onto PSN. They had made the engine, you see, that is the very good whenever it don't break due to Fox die. Fox dies, but the Fox engine came out on top. Thanks, Fox engine. But also the very expensive. Konami didn't like that very much as it seemed to be a right piece of fucking shit to work with. So the hopes of it powering much of anything aside from what Koji Pro was doing with it were minimal. Add to that, the new boss man, Hideki Hayakawa, who knocked Hideo off of his vice boy spot, was very fucking adamant about Konami having an all mobile future and that console games were mostly a waste of time. So things was already on the fritz, as stated. Though Kojima was about to put it back on the Ritz, taking very cool selfies with Guillermo del Toro and Norman Reedus and Troy Baker and Nicholas Winding Refn, who let him link up with Mats Mikkelsen and really just being a very super social boy, shaking all the right hands with totally zero plans. Sony's hands also, I'd say, like he couldn't have been public about this and so he wasn't, but the fact that he was hanging out with like half of Death Stranding's cast and was able to publish a game onto PSN without Konami knowing reeks to me of Sony also having a stake in setting this up to make sure the departure he was doomed to have would greatly work out in his favor. I mean, they had already forced him to chop his shit up and dared to poke his, at this point, disgustingly inflated head with musings of mobile game fuckeries, so he did what he did and threw a hissy fit, and made a short game teasing a fake game all about how dad was such a drag and oh so boring. Ugh, god. Also, again, you, you do very literally delete mainline MGS game logos in Ground Zeroes while leaving behind the mobile game and spin-off ones. So, so dude held a fucking grudge. Anyway, Konami, again, didn't like this and locked him away from the press, shut down his email and internet, scrubbed his bitch ass off of all promotional art, and flopped out MGS5 prematurely so dude could get booted. Oh, it's okay, it's okay. It's just me, your friendly neighborhood white man, displacing Africans while saying, this is your new home now. Deal with it. There's nothing fucked up about it, man. Trust me, it's fine. Making the legend come back to life like a big boss. Actually not being big boss like a not big boss. It's punished penis. We salty now, you see, because of that whole bass blow. Gauze is crip walking. Snake has a ponytail. Gross! Ocelot is, is here and, and, and friendly. And the Peace Walker cast is, of course, forgotten. Or, except for Paws at least, who slipped back into her role as a teenage nice girl, only she's also like a figment of Snake's imagination now. This game is weird! Like, dreamlike, even. As for one, the story is barely a thing cutscene-wise, and when it is, there's like green-eyed zombies and shit, and, and Big Boss don't speak, and the fucking bossy iPod from Peace Walker is still hanging around, and there's also a giant fire whale, and Volgan returns, but as a fireman who also don't speak, and there's this naked chick who also don't speak, and random guys you rescue also don't speak. Uh, it, it, it's it's kind of like there's a bunch of past themes and characters who return, but but not in a fan servicey way, but in this sad, disappointing, distant sort of way where nobody speak or merriment, and they'll only fight and bicker on less tapes, which are as big of a feature now as they were in Ground Zeroes, thus abstracting and decoupling all character interactions and memes that are there from the actual game. Said game though is once again pretty fucking great. 
The groundwork and control schemes is exactly the same as Zero's, aside from a few smoothies, like making it easier to menu. Only now, instead of just the prison camp, you have two whole open worlds to explore. With many a settlement, town, camp, cave, base, building, forest, vehicle, boy... And also wildlife to fuck around with. Overall, the game is more like a Peace Walker 2 aka Portable Ops 3 or MGS3 4 than it is MGS4 2 aka MGS5. Being that it builds entirely on its lineage, mechanically and narratively. Live big boss, bitch, I'm dying big boss. Hey. For one, the whole base idea is brought back again but wholly automated. No longer do you have to assign dudes to various jobs and spend ages clicking the X button at all of your updates. All you have to do is tell them what to make and collect shit for them to be able to make it and bring in more men's by way of Fulton. On the other hand though, Mother Base is now a fully explorable place and not just a menu in which you can do exciting activities such as taking a shower, walking around, driving, walking around more, triggering cutscenes, and being disappointed at all of the doors being locked. Oh. Except for this one, which is where Paws is. Or, or her ghost, or, or spirit, or, or weird clone fever dream, uh, whatever. <laughs> Shit looks great though. Made mine pink because I could, and it made for a nice backdrop while listening to the many tapes. From here is also where you can take off with your helicopter to then pick up and choose from a variety of main and side missions taking place on either of the two open maps. At Right away, I gotta say, the entire design of this shit is just so elegant. All of the helicopter landing zones, for example, have plants around them for you to collect so you don't have to stand around and wait for a pickup or can just get going with getting rewarded right away upon landing. All of the base areas have mountain ridges alongside them too, so you can use your scope to plan out a plan and tag boys for your own physical mental map. Most buildings tend to have multiple entryways, the outposts are scattered around the map just densely enough to where shit never feels barren as you'll always be hit with at least a few tiny little bite-sized set pieces with added goodies and long-term rewards one can steal for max satisfaction. And all of the larger areas will have far more than one entry point as well. In fact, being out in the open, you can typically come at them from wherever, and they'll also always feature an ogre style of level design with various layers of density and difficulty. I mean, simple patrol dudes will scout the perimeter alongside lootable little tents, tables and buildings incentivizing one to not just sneak past them callously. One or two artillery guys will be set along the main roads or entry points and will also feature many an open view from and into the base, making them very interesting but challenging little death funnels. And once inside, one can encounter all manner of mazy walkways, ladders, buildings or crawl spaces that can lead you around them, eventually capping off with a main area, like a big house or building which will frequently be jam-packed with many clever place patrols, tight doors, floors, entryways, satisfying lootables and elevation, thus functioning like a classic Metal Gear set piece entirely on their own. Not to mention that during all of these, the guardmans will be a reward in and of themselves because Fulton. So especially earlier on in the game, you'll engage with them in a far less callous way than you likely would have in any of the games prior given that you don't want to gun them all down. It's like they ain't exactly people yet, they are still just faceless little vision cones for the most part, but just the fact that disposing of them proper yields net negative results for you in the long run makes you consider them and their place. Quite literally given the tagging. I just felt a very real connection and awareness to my surrounding space, I guess, because I could see and hear them planning and walking about. Not even in a cheaty, gamey sense either, but more so in that, oh man, I better loot that tape deck fast, I can see him coming up the stairs, I just bumped my microphone up! Huh? Type away, you're prepared, but never overpowered. Stealthy, but not stuck, hiding in lockers for hours waiting for a state to pass. And just as in GZ, every Everything about this feels fucking great. Walking and crouching, horse riding along the wide open plains, fast ducking behind sandy pots and walls as you can see the hot vision sharing past you, barreling down the open roads in a car late at night, blasting 80s new wave at your enemies and sneaking into wee little sediments with atmospherically lit houses making you feel like a proper stealth god.
Like many other Japanese open world efforts, it doesn't so much impress with its scale as it does with its details, making shit feel real. Must be too. Get him. It never really felt boring to traverse the place, as each inch of rock seemed to be placed with a purpose. The same heady arcadey design that went to the struts of Metal Gear Solid 2 and the opening of 1, the House of 3, or the Middle East in 4, went into these massive fuck off maps. Enemy presence detected. The map has been updated. However, the interconnected, immersive, emergent, reactionary nature of Ground Zero's prison camp went in there too. Being that much like there, most things what you do in one place will affect another. Thing is, is that there's a finite amount of guards, sort of. Like <laughs> patrolling the whole map or individual base camps at once during one sortie. So if you cause a big ruckus, backup will follow as always, only not from thin air, but from one of the more heavily guarded areas that will then become less heavily guarded, or from one of the many patrol cars cycling the full map. You can also once again pull shit like shutting down the power or preemptively hijack cars or set up traps way ahead of time, all combining in a very natural tactical flow that isn't as simple as just triggering an alert, blowing your snake load and leaving. There's long-term effects everywhere, positive and negative, as you're basically just another, albeit more active, cog in the massive machine that is each map, regardless of what you do. You're always getting points, finding stuff, shooting stuff, stealing stuff, breaking stuff. It, it's never not game, and pretty fucking rewarding all around. See what I mean though? It's like an action movie scene simulator. The level design of the individual base pockets is also pretty great. I I saw some people praising Ground Zeroes' Camp Omega design while saying that this game don't do that, which, I don't know man, seems like a fat hunk of bullshit to me. Just cause you spent hours digging around in one, the seeing all of the MGS3 house-esque ins and outs, and not quite as long with these places, thus maybe seeing them as more one and done affairs, don't mean that the Lego levels, snake mans, guard mans of games past aren't excellently built upon here. And so, I'd like to highlight a few in particular just to highlight this. First of all, there's the Waxint Barracks, a walled fortress within front quite the intricate lines of trenches, artilleries and dude posts. You can come at it from the hill to scope out the front or from either sides to maybe have less of a plan, but not to have to take the first layer head on. It's vertical as well, which gives it an air of MGS3's mountain scaling where you need to do a bit of a zigzag to bypass all of the potential threats coming from up above or down below, like the car guy patrolling side to side, the jogging dudes going up or downhill, the dudes taking turns manning the outposts, and the few stationary boys keeping an eye out too. Anyway, once you get past all of that, you get to the main entrance, a funnel of potential death that you need to get passed through and some Something that trips you up, keeps you on your toes, seeing as you couldn't really plan for it. However, off to the right hand side, there is a hilltop one can sneak to to get to some higher ground, but only after you sneak in blindly first, no doubt missing it or going straight for the nearest buildings. Or at least that's if you're 2015 me. 2019 me discovered that you could totally wick your way up the rocks next to the entrance to find yourself on top of it and scope out shit proper before heading in. From there you will find two hilltops on either side with guard posts that may or may not be manned, essentially framing the base in a sense. And on the right hand you'll have a few construction trailers filled with goodies and sleeping boys who can wake up when noise so you need to mind the stomp, the door slam, whatever their sleeping schedule is and maybe not come crashing in through the windows. Something that'll alert them all though, but could benefit you depending on the time of day is the power box that you can switch off here too. 
And on the left hand side, there's a larger open area with some containers and goodies, but also big easy spotage because open, which is where the power box cutting might come in handy. And here is also some various entrances to the main centerpiece, the unfinished building, with multiple floors, doors, rooms, loots and ways inside. Like, you can brave the fortifications out front and just go into the front door, take the stairs from the left hand side, work your way up either of the roofs to drop on down some holes, or sneak out back and climb through the windows. Overall, it's just a very interesting little place with so many moving parts like the cars, the sleepies, the patrols, the lights, the entrances towards the many entrances. Shit's great. And people need to quit sleeping on it. The same goes for the bridge, with its winding highways providing death funnel as well as higher ground. Big barriers you can sneak behind, the actual main road for Max Rambo, the giant gorge you can sneak through to circumvent the whole thing, rock faces one can scale to do the same, and the multiple levels of scaffolding on the bridge itself, reminiscent of the strut walkways of two, only far more detailed given that shit's interconnected and also far bigger. And of course, there's also the usual tents and huts and posts scattered about too. Just as they are with the big temple, with an outside area similar to the big base. Only far riskier due to the open space laced with guard towers, thus really incentivizing you to make clever usage of the many high as fuck cliff sides one can approach this bitch from. So you can safely make your way into the horror game maze that lies inside. Or what about the hillside town, with its gigantic toy box of elevation, small winding paths and enterable huts and hangable ledges, allowing you to scale your way down getting the drop on many a boys, or climb your way on up making sure you don't get the drop. Not to mention all of the houses here being quite large with tons of windows and multiple doors thus requiring you to be on them toes. And there's also this giant fortress with hella crawl spaces that lead into inner areas and secret entry points along the back with cool mountainy drops and the big ass base camp out front and of course the walls themselves being full on snake man guard mans in their own right with many a sneaky ladder and sneaky hole and many 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 more shits like this that I could all deeply analyze, like the oil plant or the launch base, which both offer about as much intricacies as Camp Omega did respectively, what with all of the climbing you can do in either, or the fucking mansion, which is literally just the house from 3 or the mansion from 4 but in V, but won't because I'm kinda done talking about this shit. Long story, slightly extended more though, all locales on these two maps air bits of this design, as do all of the smaller outposts dotted around the map. <sighs> and yet, it was like nobody even cared to notice. The rage, the hype, and the mass disappointment behind its release is one thing, but my god was this game's review cycle an absolute clusterfuck. Bootcamp reviews fucking up the journalists, pee baby butthurt fucking up the otherwise grounded Game Boys, and reactions countering that, as well as people being rightfully torn as is evident in the videos by yours truly and people like Bunny Hop, made for the most divisive, discussion heavy game release I have ever fucking seen. To such a degree that even still there's people desperately clinging on to the idea that there's more to this game than meets the eye. Legit trying to quell the pain with a phantom game that simply ain't real. Granted, the trailers do promise that game somewhat, but it's still really strange looking back at it. Like, every review of this game sucks. Even if you think you got it, you ain't got it. Taking it for a fun toy box donkey style means ignoring the genuine lack of plot and completely disingenuous marketing, but focusing only on that is a massive disservice to what an insanely dense and detailed game this is. But then, does its design encourage one to fuck with that detail properly? Does it require your own creative approaches? Do either of those things even matter? I mean, you could argue that the trankage of games past didn't encourage shit either. Hell, if anything, I'd say that the one-hit-kill repetitive bullshit missions do that way more, seeing as you're bound to play differently at some point having just done the same shit over and over for the past 10 fucking hours. But then, why is it gotta be that way in the first place? And why are there such big plot points hidden away as secrets? All the while, the bland shit that should have been optional gets shoved to the forefront. Why are some bits deceptively dense and others scathingly empty? 
constantly tugging at your mystery boner, forever edging you towards the ball flick that is the ending. What I'm getting at, anyway, is that you can't really pin this game down due to its biggest strengths also being its biggest flaws. In a sense, making for a game that almost feels like it's meant to be disappointing. Which... could this be? The titular Phantom Pain? Eh, probably. But also, they locked Kojima in a room for six months, not allowing him to communicate with his own team. So this game being unfinished is either entirely out of the dev team's hands, or a fitting fuck you to those at the top Kojima deemed responsible. And I, I kind of fuck with that. As an artistic statement, or as a shitty situation of circumstance, MGS5 had to be unfinished for it to be what it needed to be. The Phantom Game. Though it might be worth taking a step back from all of the grand statements and figure out what may or may not be on purpose. Cause I don't think all of it was either. Like, for example, a lot of the game feels super hazy and dreamlike. It starts off with boss awaking from a deep coma in the slowest, most time-skippy process ever, with people making zero sense and barely acknowledging you because you don't speak, even when motherfuckers start getting killed in front of your fucking face. Like a suffocating dream where you wanna yell out, but can't. And hell, even who exactly you are is left super vague. With the doc being all, this is what you look like and we're gonna make you look like this, only you, you never do end up looking like that. And again, time skips around a lot here, almost like it's edited out of sequence, which is a vibe the game never really manages to shake off. Time remains fragile. Like, you can pick up a pup and only mere hours later it's a fully grown doggo. You also travel between the Seychelles and Afghanistan on a wee whim every day, which, uh, you know, that, that's quite the fucking distance. And because all missions come from a menu and are selectable whenever, you never do really get a clear vibe in regards to when they are happening in relation to one another. This shit even extends to the endings, which are just cutscenes that unlock once conditions are met. Or, uh, well, uh, I guess that's all video game endings, technically speaking. But usually set conditions will be like reaching the end, you know, chronologically and linearly. Not, not just happening out of the blue from a menu with shit afterwards continuing as if it was just another throwaway mission as cause an ocelot keep chatting on like none of it ever happened. And god forbid anyone ever really speaks up about or acknowledges any of this either. Because, as I've established very subtly and intelligently, people in this game don't tend to speak much outside of the tapes. Big Boss, Quiet. Kit Mantis, random NPCs, Volgan, and all of the anime terrorist goons who you encounter are all functionally mute. Okay. What are you waiting for? Move! Oh, oh, he's gonna. Guys, he's gonna say something. He's gonna talk. No? Hello? Snake? Snake? Boss, you are going to regret this. Snake? That woman! I know. Oh! She knows our location. He speaks! This is because language and the loss thereof is a theme in this game. In its development, through Kojima being censored off of the box art and him not being allowed to communicate with his team, and as mentioned before, having his email and internet access cut off during the later stages of development, and also not being allowed to make any public appearances or statements, as was infamously shown at the Game Awards. As you noticed, uh, Hideo Kojima is not here with us uh, tonight, and I want to tell you a little bit about that. Uh, Mr. Kojima had every intention of uh, being with us tonight, uh, but unfortunately, he was uh, informed by a lawyer representing Konami uh, just recently that uh, he would uh, not be allowed to uh, travel to uh, tonight's awards ceremony to uh, accept um, any awards. 
It's, uh, he's still under an employment contract and it's, uh, it's disappointing and it's, it's inconceivable to me that a, an artist like Hideo would not be allowed to come here and celebrate with his peers and uh, his fellow uh, teammates uh, such an incredible game as Metal Gear Solid V. But also in the game itself, through the fact that Skullface, as established in Zeros, had lost everything that would make him him, including his mother tongue. And so he has this obsession with language and his weirdly abstract evil plan to release vocal cord parasites into the world that will rid humankind of its ability to speak. Which is also very subtle and intelligent, and moreover, most certainly on purpose. All of what I brought up so far just clicks, tonally and thematically and autobiographically from Kojima's point of view. So I see no reason to believe this to be anything other than intentional. Same with the smudged clean slate. You see, Peace Walker sold like ass, especially outside of Japan. And somehow this was actually taken as people just not fucking with the characters, rather than it being on the old ass PSP and it being touted as a spin-off rather than a mainline game. I know this because this was given as the reason as to why Cause was scrubbed off of the international box art for Ground Zeroes. It, yeah, we are this fucking stupid right now. Anyway, I take it this had a big effect on how shit was written as well as the entire Peace Walker cast gets fucked over, quite literally in some cases. I mean, Chico, after being forced into rape and having been tortured, actually did die in the heli crash at the end of Ground Zeroes. This gets revealed with no weight or mood to it in an optional tape. She says she wishes Chico could be there. That revolution was the dream. For Amanda, for Chico, whatever supplies and their you father. Need, just let us know, boss. That chopper was no place for Chico to die. I'd like to at least think history will remember his part in the revolution. When you pick up a gun, there's always a chance you'll die for nothing. He knew that as well as the rest. Now that he's gone, it's up to the rest of us to decide what it was all worth. If we don't, there's nothing to prove that Chico ever lived at all. R.I.P. The original gnome. no idea what you're saying. Amanda only gets a mere mention, being that she's back in Nicaragua and Costa Rica doing simple intel work for the gang, I guess. Latin America isn't as close as I'd like, but we have Amanda and her people to help in that department. Cecile also gets mentioned. I, I, I know that because the wiki told me, though I can't recall ever hearing anything in particular. Paz is of course a ghost stuck in the past, locked away in a room of hazy particles and vague unreal scenarios which well I, I don't think i need to tell you how that fits in with the dreamlike state and strange love was killed by huey or uh i i think the jury isn't fully out on that one though that doesn't stop them from torturing the dude frequently and shipping him off in a boat left to fuck himself at sea you do get a tape way late into the game where you can hear strange love slowly but surely dying from neglect and starvation as she gradually loses her mind Anyway, I guess I can say what needs to be said. I can still do that much. Talk to you. Did, did I mention how dirty this new slate is yet? Did, did, did I point that out? Because it is. It's gross! And yeah, all of this makes the game feel super distant from the decidedly more comfy, fun, and memeable vibes of the game's conversations past. Because it very literally distant itself from these people by either killing them off or shutting them up, or in Ocelot's case, having him undergo intense brainwashing pre-game just so that he'll play along nice and friendly with the yet to be revealed big twist. No one's really acting like how they should be acting if they are even acting at all, like a bad dream you can't wake up from. And much like the game that quote came from, it is pretty hecking clear to me that a lot of deliberate choices went into making it feel that way.
but some things also add to it unintentionally. Again, Snake's voice being different makes him feel different and distant, but if that was some sort of deliberate mind blow and not just Kojima horn dogging on Hollywood, then surely the Japanese version should have undergone a voice change too. Or how about all of your buddies, like the horse and dog, getting two costumes and visual upgrades like camo or battle armor? Except in Quiet's case, where she just turns gold or gets covered in blood, which came from this cutscene, or can wear an army uniform, which came from the opening. Shit reeks of, oh fuck, we need to fill in the two skin slots, but we don't have any time. Quick, just re these assets and slap some random textures on that bitch. Or how about there being a few very fleshed out areas that aren't used much at all? I mean, it's cool to have them there for sure, but I can't help but feel that more was probably intended for these. Or, uh, what about you building an entire Metal Gear, again, only to not be able to use it for anything. Vehicle controls are a big deal here and the maps is open enough to make it work, but nope. Can't even see it being deployed as you could in Peace Walker. And probably by far and away the most strangest unfinished tree of all is the now infamous ride scene, where Big Boy and Skull Child just kinda sit there. No dialogue. No directing, just a song playing as the car drive with their idle animations playing out. And, and sure, yeah, this does kind of add to the whole dreamlike and distant thing too, but I mean, you know that that don't mean that it was meant to be this way. Because, I mean, you can finna fucking destroy the lingua franca all you want, and the moment of silence seems to be in order then for sure, but not without like any contemplative animations or, you know, actual silence. There's just no tension here, nothing that makes it seem deliberate. Just placeholder vibes and nothing much else. Honestly, like most things I went over before, it's probably a combination of both creative intent and the development being cut short. Oh, a weirdly intimate and awkward one-to-one? -one? Cool idea, Mr. Kojima. It's just that we ran out of time and oh no, they cut off his internet again. Ah well, fuck it. Leave the scene for now, we'll patch it up later. That seems like the most down-to-earth and empathetic angle I could take here and, and what I'll be taking for most of this video. Like, take the actual ending for example, or, or at least the one with the most closure, being relegated to an unfinished scene dumped onto a bonus disc. Again, it's the phantom pain for a phantom game, which is a theme, but uh, a bit excessive if wholly intentional in it. People not talking, some missions straight up repeating way late into the game, time fittingly being fucky and everything else I've brought up so far seems like the perfect marriage of intent and fuck. Hell, the first ending, which isn't even a real ending but one of the endings they could at least finish, is an incredibly flaccid climaxless affair in which Snake and Cause somewhat pathetically take out the already left for dead Skullface, in a straight up nega version of the boss's death from Metal Gear Solid 3 whilst also very clearly getting fucked over on all fronts. Not really getting their flawed, vengeful Phil's fulfillment and only exposing how almost the entirely mute cast are kind of villains. Liquid, Evil Big Boss, Mantis, Ocelot, Vulgan, Boz have all been on the bad side of whoever you were playing as at the time. And while Huey, Cause and Quiet aren't explicitly villains, Hugh Hugh is a very flawed and kind of snaky sneaky sniveling little bitch of a man who may or may not have killed his wife and screwed you over in the past. Quiet at the very least was a villain, and Cause is mostly just a giant piece of shit garbo douchebag asshole motherfucker this time around. We're the good guys, y'all. We're doing the right thing. Live big boss. Die big boss. But see what I mean though? It, it's impossible to fully pin shit down because of how complicated people's feelings for it are as a whole, no less the development. And even despite everything, I still find it very hard to believe that Konami really is this evil and shitty towards its employees as the fuck Konami drones would like to imply. 
Though, I guess the reports don't lie, but then the reporters weren't actually there, and maybe Kojima spending 80 mil on an unfinished game warranted some type of repercussions. Not to mention how much creative freedom him, his team, and most other people at Konami did have for many years. Is that because Konami top brass just don't give a fuck, or is it because shit's not as bad as we all think it is? And, and what we know is only a recent thing because of how fucked up and messy this game's development was. Also, if Konami is so bad, then why are so many legacy folks still working there? Why are even Team Silent members like Ito still willing to do work for them from time to time? Is it because of the ex-con shit? Maybe. But if that is true, then how come Ito can still do what he do? Or Iga? Or Treasure? Or Siren Man? Is it because they have enough clout to stave away the blacklistings? Perhaps. Would explain why Shenta or Junko Kawano completely disappeared off of the face of the earth. But then, so do many other devs, Japanese or otherwise, simply because AAA development sucks fuck in general. So maybe Konami isn't any worse than any other AAA studio. Maybe instead of singling them out, we should tell the entire money-hungry operation to go fuck itself. Maybe we should topple the fucking government! Okay, okay, uh, maybe not quite yet. But look, uh, I don't know and neither do you. And unless people like Kojima or Fukushima or Shinta start writing fully detailed autobiographies, we'll never truly will. Nor do we truly know the skinny on which parts of this games were intentionally left as they were or what was genuinely mismanaged. So we might as well just take it for what it is. A very horny video game. Uh, she got burnt and thrown out of a window and, and now she naked. So I've been using the all work no play meme throughout this entire retrospective, not just as a way to subtly and comedically highlight Kojima's pension for objectification, sometimes tasteful and with reason and most times just downright gratuitous, but also as a way to artistically imply the overwork that this series led to. As stated in the very first video, all work and no play makes Kojima a horny boy after all. Not to say that that this is actually a product of overwork. I, I, I can't look into his head or anyone else on the dev team, but the reasons that I paralleled the two commentaries like that was to show that as how the dev team behind the games fell apart due to set pressure and overwork, Kojima gained more unquestioned authority regarding his directing choices and as a result the games got increasingly less subtle, clever and big headed. Not just in the sexy department, but it's most easily noticeable there. With MGS4 being all up in that camel toe with little to no justification, and Peace Walker being all up in that 16 year old with absolutely no justification other than that she wasn't actually 16 you guys, which don't fix shit cause it's still brought to you under the impression that she is and is done by Big Boss with him under the impression that she is as well so, so it's still creepy. And V being up quiet's ass with really fucking terrible justification. So much so that even those who would otherwise scoff at my video game sexism comments were kind of like, uh, okay, this is just a naked lady who shoves her ass in the cam as a reward. Thus making it the most fitting peak of this overwork slash sexualization slash subtlety parallel narrative I have been shoehorning into all of these videos. What's funny though is that Kojima shoved said ass with the implications of there being a very dark and deep reason behind set behind. We would be ashamed for thinking that this was just a shallow bit of fan pandering. Which uh, I mean yeah, she got burnt and her being quiet ties into the lingua franca parasites theme but her being naked is just because she breathes through her skin or some shit, it, it, it's not really doing it. After that, the fact that she nearly gets raped in the end. Then she comes out all badass, murder, psychopath, but then the camera goes all... 
And it's like, what what even is the tone anymore? It's like an action parody, but also legit cool, but also rape. And so you end up with this comedic rape revenge parody action scene. And, and I don't think I need to tell you why comedic rape might not be the greatest direction. I'm not ashamed anyway, but Kojima probably should be. And he waffled on about other dark themes too, some of which are actually kind of there. Like you can find the charred corpses on stack at the remains of a village in Africa because their existence was inconvenient to the local oligarchs who also gave the water this really nice sheen. And hey, there's also all of this shit. And of course, it also follows up from the force rape in Ground Zeroes and it talks about how fucked up real life war is all the time with Russia invading Afghanistan and shit. And while I don't think it really earns most of these topics, I can at least see that they'd probably wanted to include more, but just couldn't due to how unfinished most of the game is. Well, either that or he deliberately tried to set up people for disappointment knowing Konami was about to fire him anyway, or shit just wasn't written very well. You know, fuck-ups happen. By far, the most prevalently promised theme, though, was one that set at the core of this very series. It gave us Raiden. It gave us Liquid. It gave us googly eyes in jars. It gave us gnomes. Facility. Stop that leak. This may seem like <laughs> Cause like, you save a handful of them and ain't allowed to gun them down. Though, the darkest thing to happen to them is fucking Big Boss himself saying a little training he'll make himself useful. Thus, perpetuating their PTSD-written lives only under assumedly better circumstances cause it's not like you really ever get to see any of that. They just end up becoming another number in the mother base machine. Which, I mean, is a type of commentary in and of itself, but it's not exactly what I'd call impactful or otherwise noteworthy. And I think I've figured out why, too. You see, simply saying child soldier bad or Africa fucked up isn't enough for people to truly care for it plot device wise, outside of saying, uh huh. It sure is. It doesn't really hit in the same way that shit would in case of IRL because it ain't IRL. It doesn't bear the connotations or relations or associations that it has if you'd see it on the news fully realizing the implications. And so you'd need to tie it to something your audience does care about plot device wise, like an existing character. Just as they do in Metal Gear Solid 2 with Raiden. The child soldier stuff means something there within the four walls of the story and so it means something to you too. And they do try to do that here by having the leader of the child soldier gang be Young Liquid. Only, you know, he's, he's just a little shit ass and most of his arc is on an unfinished bonus disc. And thus it entirely falls flat as it is undercooked, not built up very well, and like most of the game's attempts at emotional gut punches, wholly hollow. Which is weird as well as the various other aspects of the raw script are really, really fleshed out. You see, instead of the nano machine son, the MacGuffin this time revolves around the already mentioned parasites. Besides these, retroactively explaining how the Cobras from Metal Gear Solid 3 got their funky freaky powers in a pretty detailed way, they're also used in Skullboy's wipe out all speech plan, being that these parasites attach themselves to people's vocal cords based on which language the individual speaks due to how they've evolved in the various corners of the world. Which gets explained in stupid detail, chronicling how shit started off with them nesting in the nasal cavities of dinosaurs and therefore eventually the vocal cords of birds, and how because these parasites breed when certain vibrations are made, they changed how the birds would evolve too, which is why birds today, a lot like us humans, can make very complex sounds. It's like, how the fuck you finna fucking write a goddamn MacGuffin that not only explains why your pet parrot can say the the fuck word, but also why this asshole can shoot bees. <laughs> anyway, due to the decades of symbiotic living on humans' vocal cords all around the world, they can be attuned to a certain language, including specific accents and dialects. 
And so all Skullomania had to do was to engineer these little buggers to somehow also kill the host when they voice fuck and voila. You have yourself the ability to wipe out an entire specific ethnicity or language. It, 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 it's, it's bizarre and really fucking stupid, but I also have to admire the work probably most definitely not Kojima himself had put into this to flesh it out to such a questionably believable degree. Granted, I, I will say that I really appreciate how all of this occurs on decades of tape and how all of the in-game noises and Cosalot's interruptions override it. it it's really great and, and very well considered, truly. Because, uh, yeah, the, the game is not perfect. <laughs> Shocker, I know. And and while most criticism I've criticized so far can be leveled at the story, I do also feel that the game as a whole, so like on all fronts, is spread a bit too thin. For example, while there's loads of really strong and memorable missions in very well designed locations, there's also a lot of extract prisoner Retreat from dock capture the line the enemy, enemy assassinate my flopping dog, and so on. The, the mission quality has certain drops in Space Walker. No longer will you go ghost hunting or dragon fighting, as pretty much the whole game consists out of ye oldie snake mans and guard mans. Well made, snake mans, guard mans, don't get me wrong, but even those end up trailing off in quality or at least entertainability as the game goes on. Especially in tandem with the plot not having any satisfying sense of progression to it at all. I guess, though, to be fair, the amount of side stuff you do will greatly impact the downward spiral as most of the repetition is to be found there and shit ain't exactly mandatory, but like, not doing any at all is kinda missing the point. You need to grow that base and develop that shit and live that big boss and die that big boss, which it lets you do very well too. On a base level, shit's constantly growing with you starting off riding horse, fultoning sheep and tracking individual boys until eventually you straight up fulton entire tanks and freight containers as your solid gold naked lady guns down all motherfuckers for you from afar as you loot the place for all it's worth. Only to then leave in a blaze of rocket launchers, explosions and Billy Idol music as you drive off in your newly stolen truck. I, I quite love it. New weapons and gear also unlock at a pretty nice pace and the variety of which is also decent and generally the gameplay just strikes the perfect balance between Rambo mode and proper stealth. Being that you can be a sneaky asshole or cleverly loud or both at the same time in increasing intensities over the course of the entire game. Shit's organic, I guess, just as the guard behaviors were from previous mention. So even if you're taking out heavy tank unit number 5, you will still get to do it in your own uniquely emergent way, being that you sure as shit couldn't fault in that bitch the first time around. But yeah, while the tank bang act 5 might still be prima gucci, by the time you get to tank fuck revenge of the one hit kill part 20, things may have gotten a bit too dull. Or just you know, too hard or frustrating. And less tangibly rewarding given that at this point all of your shit had been sucked up by the impossible to fathom mess of numbers, background processes and abstractions that is Mother Base. Which also sucks, honestly. I mean, it, it looks amazing and is neat enough to take a look around in from time to time when you have some tapes to keep you company, but the travel time in between struts and even just the amount of constant climbing and walking done on the struts alone make the what is essentially you going down a checklist of things you need to do there, i.e. checking in on pause, quiet and Yui, feel like far greater busy work than it ever needed to be. Not that there ain't any fast travel options, mind you, but those pause tapes, and I generally hate fast travel in general, and even then the start exploration on its own is still a hassle as I've already said. Climbing up and down the same sets of stairs, going into the same shower, getting lost on the same pipes, trying to remember which side of the R&D strut Yui's goddamn door is on every fucking time, it... it it's just not fun, and all of that's without the guarantee that shit's even gonna trigger anything in the first place. Though, again, when taken into the greater whole, I don't think it's anything too bad. 20 to 25 great hours and 5 to 10 okay-ish hours still a strong game make. It's just that it makes me wonder why it needed to be JRPG length to begin with given that the plot don't warrant it and the side ops certainly don't. It's not like cutting some of these shits down would have taken away anything crucial, so as to why it had to be like this, I, I don't know. Maybe it's an attempt at making you feel the phantom pain, but 
fucked if it is, it still feels like kind of a shitty way to go about it. I mean, in 2, the meta with Raiden is also strong, but never to the point of the actual game purposefully being made unfun. So I, I don't think that this is what that is. It, I, I think that this is just them running out of time. They went way over budget, and if you check up on interviews or the data mining that has been done, you can see that there was much more planned with even entire maps and a revisit to Camp Omega being cut. If they had those and a more solidly built up conclusion, which the bonus disc does imply, then the side ops would have been fine as they would have covered way more actual content. But alas, it was just not to be. Now, you probably already know that the game doesn't actually start with Snake bringing the legend back to life. In reality, it begins with him waking up in a hospital as he is dubbed Ahab, only to then get bum-rushed by Quiet, Gas Child, a fireman, some skull goons, and a will as he is helped along by the comparatively talkative Ishmael to his eventual escape meeting up with Ocelot. However, the game makes you play this entire section twice. Once at the start and again near the end. Which uh, I, I, I was gonna be cheeky about by copying my story start off synopsis here, but, but, but that's dumb, as it is in the game as well. Debatably dumb, though, is the new reveal that comes with the second time, being that Snake was actually Ishmael and that you, i.e. Ahab, was THE MEDIC on the helicopter at the end of GZ. Now all plastic surgeon and brainwashed to believe that he be B. What's great about this too is that at the very start you're asked to create a player avatar who will then be the medic snake and so I made my guy a big burly black boy with face stats because uh, you know they can totally work with that in terms of 80s plastic surgery. Also you see the medic in ground zeros and he clearly has far lighter skin so you know, I, I think that maybe they didn't think this through incredibly well on a technical level. Although, on a canon level, I think that this is actually pretty cool. Thing B is that it explains away how Big Boss be bad, as your Big Boss lost his shit due to all of the highly traumatizing garbage he is put through in this game. Thus becoming the evil gnome man of the first two games, as the real Big Boss went into hiding to do, you know, just whatever, right up until the end of 4 where he could set shit straight. It actually makes that seem like a bit less of a stretch. You know, by MGS standards at least. Same with Zero, who was revealed to be there to be the big evil, but is revealed to be here in tapes to just be delusional. Drunk on MGS3 memes and actual old age, but not altogether evil. Because all of this sketchy patriot shit was a direct result of Skullface stealing his thunder and later with the AI made after Zero was already near death, went haywire on its own terms. And hey, you even get some lore about him collecting old movie memorabilia and ancient artifacts and shit. See, the, the, the evil world conqueror was actually the fun-loving James Bond fan after all. Woo! For real though, as, as dumb and convoluted as all of this is, I do admire the galaxy brain gymnastics on part of Kojima, Etsu Tamari returning from Riding Rising, Shujo Murata aka Loreboy Part 2, and Hidenari Inamura who worked for Koji Pro as a programmer since Snatcher and I guess now just started writing as well, to actually retcon without retconning a story founded on flawed 80s 8-bit storytelling, Konami revenge actions with deliberate screw-ups, and generally just very questionable plot twists into, hey, I can almost believe this, territories. Even if they had to hide all of it in about an hour's worth of tape given to you without context after the ending given to you without context. <laughs> Man, what, what, what a fucking game. Not gonna lie, there's definitely a 10 out of 10 across the board masterpiece level game in there somewhere. I'd say that the first 20-ish hours even certainly feel that way. The problem is primarily that it just trails off. 
The gameplay starts to overstay its welcome with the shitty side ops, the plot doesn't give any satisfying payoffs, and it's clear to see that there's large parts of the game left greatly unfinished. Partly intentional, partially them just actually running out of budget. But regardless, I think that that's what sours the perception for many. Not remembering how great it was at the beginning, but only how disappointing it was in the end. And that's kinda sad, honestly. Though I do feel that very likely many will come back around to liking it again years from now once they replay it and go, oh wow, I, I just played this for 8 hours straight, what the fuck? But regardless, the Phantom game is really very real. Hype's a bitch, ain't it? Another thing that definitely didn't help make the aftertaste taste good was Konami by way of Hideki Hayakawa crowbarring in online functionality. Very poorly, I might add, as the game is still balanced to function perfectly without it. Never not once did I feel Skinner boxed or game ended into undefault skinning any of these gun timers. But just like 3 had an online 2 and 4 had online 2, the sequel to 3's online 1, V has online 3, the sequel to both 3 and 4's online 1's and 2's respectively, aka online 3, packed in with V aka 5. I haven't played it, and I honestly don't care to. I, I saw this one donkey video around the time it came out, and a few funny images of hats being thrown around on Twitter, and that's about all she wrote. Seems like it could be fun though. Was developed by a new Koji Pro sub studio in LA that promptly got shot down before the game had even released, which is sad. But I also can't really care less at this point. I, I do remember a lot of people complaining about this online thing called FOBs though, and to this day I still don't really know know what they are. See, when I played V initially, it was before launch. I had a hookup who broke street dates and got the game about a week and a half early and thus was already way close to the end by the time the day one patch with online functionality dropped. So I was looking forward, I guess, to seeing what all of the hubbub was about this time around, but uh, aside from two new menu options that unlocked about halfway through the game, I experienced nothing new. So <laughs> I still don't fully know what an FOB is, but, but people don't like them, so you know. There you go. I do think this says a lot though about how incredibly well considered 5's online aspects were truly. About as well considered as Kojima's backup plan- Oh, uh, he, he got fired? And yet here he is, already on couch, with Andrew House announcing his new studio. Huh. That's funny how fast he, he got that sorted. He even took some of his best boys along, including art master Shinkawa and... Um, well... Shujo ain't there. Or Okamura. Or even Shinta. Hmm. And so, as Kojima leaves, he had blown up the gulags, but it also left behind the dust. No longer diamonds, and now a mere lifeless shell of their former selves. If there's anything I wanted to do with this retrospective, it was to humanize the faces working for Konami. People fucking hate that company, and if the reports of how they treat their employees are indeed true, then yeah, fuck them. But that's also only a silver lining at the corporate top. A bunch of faceless suits none of y'all know. Who, who might be a Yakuza family, by the way. Like, I'm just saying, their terminology and structure is very Tojo. I'm just saying. And so, hate got shoved in anywhere it could be attached to. Tom Hewlett, tentative Silent Hill producer of the game's past Team Silent. Well, fuck him then. All of it must be his fault. Fuck actually doing any research into what he actually did and how he too was mismanagedly forced to work on bullshit. Uh, uh oh. Survive? Oh no, well that's just soulless. It's just corporate Konami being gross, making a shitty survival game. Never mind the fact that it had people working on it who had been there since the first solid. Never mind that Team Silence monster designer willingly came on board to help out the dev team. No! The anger needed a face. Or at least a name to latch onto, and this game became it. It's uh, it's actually pretty alright though. 
<laughs> not gonna review it again as my review is pretty definitive in regards to expressing my still current opinion on it so a link to that is in the comments hopefully and it definitely is in this retrospectives playlist if you watched it like that but it's really not worthy of a mass hate train if that hate has to go anywhere, I'd propose it go to the economic and societal structures that allowed Konami to flourish how it did in the first place, rather than any one individual or game caught in the crosshairs of that. Hell, for all you know, Noriaki Okamura, producer of Portable Ops and Acid 2, and writer and director of Zone of the Enders 1, and big dick programmer on the original Metal Gear Solid, is simply there because shit ain't actually all that bad. Or maybe he felt undervalued by Kojima and didn't want to go with. Or maybe he was just waiting out his contract. Or, or maybe he doesn't want to get x -conned. You don't know, and neither do I. But they did put cries for help in Survive, so blindly painting it as a purely cynical endeavor feels horribly unempathetic and shitty. Not that it don't have no flaws or that it's some type of gem hidden in plain sight or anything, but again, watch my review. Either way, this is how the series ends. Not, Not with, with a bang, bang but a with whimper. a whimper. Though, as MGS2's ending implied, and 1's, and Metal Gear 2's, and 4's, and also threes, there will always be a glimmer of hope left in the memes worth passing on. To tell you the truth, I think you and I both know that this isn't the end. This entire retrospective was but a ploy to write a meta-commentary on Metal Gear's development. Never stated in the literal text, but most certainly there in the spaces between the lines. Obscured, hidden, but no doubt present the more times you rewatch. Picking apart the various mumbo-jumbos and knick-knacks coming away, feeling more fulfilled every time just as one would with the games within this series. Never compensating for my not yet properly inflated ego penis, aka my big dick, aka my hideo head, and thusly, as the series loops back around in the end, so will the self filating snake that is this retrospective, never imploding, but forever connected to the strand that is its physical being. After all, we still have more bridges to burn, don't we, dear viewer?